Alcatraz Island rises abruptly from the cold waters of San Francisco Bay. Formerly a military fortress, Alcatraz became America's most notorious maximum security prison, housing such incorrigibles as Al Capone and Babyface Nelson. No prisoner ever escaped from Alcatraz alive. When it closed in 1963, the spirits of some may have remained behind, forever imprisoned within its massive wall. I've heard that the hallway directly behind me, Broadway, is haunted, and that if you sleep on the cells, you'll hear the cell doors opening and closing all night long, and that they actually move. Well, I didn't believe it. One night I spend the night, I sleep on Broadway. All night long, I heard the mechanism that would operate the cell door. And one security guard told us that he was patrolling, He's the only one on the island. He had gone down a flight of stairs into the shower room. He got to the bottom, he stopped, and then he felt this hand touch him on the back of the neck, jumped, panicked, looked around. Nobody was there. We would have fun greeting him for the next couple of weeks. You walk up behind him quietly and put a hand on him and hair would go straight up. Cell Block D held the prison hospital and served as an isolation unit for prisoners like the Birdman of Alcatraz, Robert Stroud, whose cell, many say, is haunted. There have been ghosts seen, there have been mediums that have been up in the hospital and had seances and heard voices, had the presence of a spirit. There is also uh, hydrotherapy, a room where they put people into the bathtubs. Prisoners, if they became emotionally upset, would be put on a table, cold towels wrapped around them, and put basically into a trance. No prisoner was ever executed at Alcatraz, though there were eight murders and five suicides. Still, unexplained events continue to take place. I know several people who refuse to be out here after dark because the voices start talking to them. I've never seen any ghosts out here, but there are nights that I've walked down the hallway and you almost hear prisoners in their cell brushing their teeth, combing their hair, the squeaking of the beds, those type sounds, even when there's nobody here but me just walking around. How and why does a place become haunted? And if ghosts exist, why? These questions have been asked, but never answered. The reality is that they are around us all the time. There are a number of theories of why we have ghosts. Um, the most practical one, I suppose, is people that the desire is so great within them that they have to keep coming back to where they existed or there's some great emotional pullback and they cannot totally accept the fact that they've left the physical body. In San Jose, California, visiting ghosts must navigate through a Victorian mansion built according to blueprints received from the spirit world. In the Winchester house, unwanted ghosts travel at their own risk, twisting corridors, a maze of stairways, and doors to nowhere were designed to confuse evil spirits. Do the spirits of the night still visit? Employees report ghostly visages and other unexplained phenomena. The first time I was actually alone in the house, and I wandered off into one of the closed off rooms. I guess it was one of the servants' bedrooms, and I let the door close behind me, and it felt the, the air pressure got really heavy in there and it felt like the walls were getting closer. I mean, I had to get out of that room really quickly. A lot of people have claimed to see lights in that room, and there's no electricity in the room at all. And I hear, you know, footsteps and creaking boards and whisperings whenever I'm cleaning in the house or whenever I close in the house, and there's nobody in the house when we're closing it. The mansion was built by Sarah Winchester, heir to the Winchester Firearms Fortune. 
William Winchester. William. When a Boston medium informed Sarah that the deaths of her husband and only child were brought about by evil spirits slain by Winchester rifles, she was advised to head west. In California, Sarah transformed a simple farmhouse into a mansion for the spirit world. Here, she was safe. For as long as Sarah kept building, she would be protected from vengeful spirits. For 38 years, 24 hours a day, construction continued, even after losing three stories to the San Francisco earthquake in 1906. Today, the house sprawls over six acres of landscaped grounds. It contains 160 rooms, 47 fireplaces, 13 bathrooms, 52 skylights, and nearly 10,000 windows. Tiffany glass, rare wood, and other building materials of the highest quality were used extensively, adding to building costs that totaled nearly five and a half million dollars when construction ended after Sarah's death in 1922. Midnight until 2 a.m. were the ghosting hours at the Winchester house. During this time, Sarah contacted the spirit world for guidance. We've had some seances in the past where we've had different psychics come in and, and conduct a seance to see if, if they could raise uh, the spirits of either Sarah Winchester or anybody else who was involved in the construction of the house. And uh, we've had a couple of psychics say that there are spirits in the house, uh, three spirits to be exact. There was a seance held a few years back inside the Daisy bedroom. And from what I've heard, a woman named Antoinette May and another man were staying alone in the house that night. And about late in the evening, the woman started to hear organ music coming from outside of the Daisy bedroom where they were staying. Well, the man didn't hear it. That is until he opened the door to the Daisy bedroom. And when he opened the door, he could hear it, only she couldn't hear it anymore. They closed the door for good, and that apparently disgruntled the spirits, as the next thing you knew, the floor was shaking very violently in the Daisy bedroom. The next morning, there were no reports of an earthquake, but there were two broken keys on the pipe organ down here in the Grand Ballroom. Some believe Sarah Winchester still haunts the house. The tour guide had said he came in to the room where Mrs. Winchester died, and he noticed there was an indent in a pillow. And he fluffed the pillow back up, and he came back a little while later with a tour, and the indent was back in the pillow. For Sarah, the blue room was the soul of the mansion. Here, she made contact with the spirit world. No one ever entered the room while Sarah lived. Some believe it's still a doorway for visitors from another dimension. Once you really experience something like that, then you know that there is something beyond what we can see with our physical eyes. This substance formed, it's a smoky a substance, it's, um, it's a gelatin-like substance. Sometimes I see them so clearly that they look like, like flesh people to me. At other times, it's more of a blurry image. Ghosts are often found at the site of death or tragedy, and America's battlefields from Gettysburg to Little Bighorn hold the souls of soldiers who died before their time. So when day turns to night, soldiers return to duty, forever on guard in places like Fort Washington, Valley Forge, and Fredericksburg, just a few of the battlegrounds of haunted America. America's landscape is dotted with haunted places. One of the most famous hauntings occurred in 1848 in a small wood frame house in Hydesville, New York. Two sisters, Margaret and Catherine Fox, began communicating with an unseen spirit. Their communication so captured the public's imagination that within a few years, spiritual congregations were springing up across the country. 
On the banks of Casadega Lake, near Jamestown, New York, a group purchased property to build a spiritual community, christened the City of Light. Today, it is known as the Lilydale Assembly, one of the largest communities of spiritualists and mediums in the world. Spiritualism is the science, philosophy, and religion of continuing life. Spiritualists believe that there is no death. There are only different ways of living. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. If I talk with someone who's had a message, please let me know, because we like to read this message. We also believe that there is communication between the physical expression of life and the spiritual expression of life. And this is where the mediumship part of spiritualism comes in. Is this father, please? Grandfather. Grandfather. Thank you, because he comes in so strongly with you. What happens is that we are able to communicate with people who have passed on. Actually, we don't communicate with them, they communicate with us. I'm a clairvoyant, which is technically clear seeing. Readings before? No, I haven't. When I do a reading, I kind of step out of my body a little bit, just kind of go out of phase with it. And I send out a thought for the people that this person wishes to communicate with. When people touch in from spirit, and when I say spirit, I mean someone who has died, they identify themselves. Sometimes it's a name, it might be a relationship, it might be the way they died. I never know what's going to come through. It might even be a last name of Stevens. I didn't hear it very clearly. We believe that everyone has the capacity to tune in to spirit. Most people don't seem to choose to use it. I have never walked into any building where I couldn't sense some spirit activity. Spirits are everywhere. Far to the south of Lilydale, New York, the waters of the Mississippi arrive at a city with a soul and character all its own. New Orleans is a place where time seems to stand still, where the past mixes with the present, the living with the dead. arrived with slaves from Africa and the Caribbean. Today, it is practiced much as it was then, with rituals and ceremonies to call forth the spirits of the dead. A frequent guest is the spirit of Marie Laveau, the feared and respected queen of voodoo. Marie was said to be over 100 years old when she died, and as beautiful as ever. Today, her grave has become a shrine to her many followers, who pay homage by leaving small gifts and strange markings on her tombstone. New Orleans' past is full of ghostly legends. Located in the French Quarter is one of the nation's first pharmacies. But legend has it that in other parts of the building, a doctor practiced a more gruesome form of medicine performing medical experiments on human subjects. Strange noises and ghostly apparitions are said to be those of his victims. A few blocks away was the 19th century home of Madame Lolori, a prominent and respected socialite, until workmen discovered a hidden upstairs room where she tortured chained slaves. Her dark secret exposed, she was forced to flee the city, leaving behind only the ghosts of her victims, who still haunt the property. A few minutes from the French Quarter is the Southern Knight's bed and breakfast, the site of a series of paranormal occurrences. There were such strange things that went on when I first bought the house. I would hear sounds and whispers and voices. Um, my housekeeper, my son, would come to me and say, did you call me? And I hadn't. When we first moved in here, that's when I first started to notice the first strange occurrences. Uh, a few times when I walked in different rooms, the hair would stand up on the back of my neck as if someone was in the room with me. When I look around, no one's there. I discounted it as something, maybe it's just in my imagination. It's a sense that somebody is there. An overwhelming sense that you're not alone in a room. The cold spots, the cold places, 
where it's just cold around you. You can feel it. I always felt something very strange when I would go through the dining room. It was like the air was heavier here than it was in the other parts of the house. It was like I couldn't breathe. A few other times we had mainly mechanical electrical phenomena, lights would turn on. Alarm clocks that would set off when I'd make sure that all the alarm clocks were disconnected. Doors locked themselves. Um, doors which I had just opened just a few minutes early and no one else was up there with me. And then I started having these experiences with my guests who would tell me these incredible stories. To better understand the strange occurrences, Judy contacted Larry Motts, a parapsychologist and paranormal investigator. Our actual organization is the International Society for Paranormal Research, and we have what we call Hauntings Today Investigations and Ghost Expeditions. We conduct scientific investigations of phenomena and try to determine, using scientific methods, what's going on. Larry sent a staff member to investigate the haunting. And I said, why don't you go around and, and look at everything, you know, check out all the rooms. So she, when she came back, she said, do you know you have an entity in the house? I never thought about it, but then all of a sudden, it really made sense. I think this is very definitely a haunted house. What we'll do is go ahead and we'll start here and then proceed through each floor as we go. Our particular organization is a little unique in the fact that we use a combination of scientists as well as psychic okay, investigators. We'll when we get in the building, you just kind of start sensing what you feel. Okay. And then we use equipment like cameras, thermal radiation, ultrasound, magnetometers for electromagnetic energy fields. Any device that we feel can maybe detect some type of phenomena. We have conducted numerous investigations in haunted hotels, just like the Bourbon Orleans Hotel here in the French Quarter in New Orleans. There have been people walking by this particular guest room suite and have heard a little girl crying. <laughs> Hotel managers proceed to go up there, knock on the door, no answer, um, walk in, no one's there. The cook that used to work in the kitchen would be working at night, especially the third floor. He said you'd hear voices at night, people talking, things going across the room. He actually got the lights went out one night and got slapped across the face and left a handprint on his face. He left and did not come back. When we first entered the property, of course, the, the psychic okay, said that bourbon. they were definitely feeling energy that was a little Shannon, unusual as we anything? walked in. The psychic investigators that we use, what they do is they actually give us additional information in a site. Um, scientifically, we can go in and detect at times different types of phenomena that might be occurring, but we can't tell you yeah, who the entity is or, or what's going on or what the entity looks like and so on, where the psychic investigative the team has that ability. You get the impression that this staircase is older, probably original to the building, this one. As we building. proceeded to the ballroom area, we were able to get uh, a number of unusual electromagnetic energy readings, as well as cold spots, which are pretty common to a haunting. We also experienced some poltergeist activity uh, with one of the chandeliers that actually started to move. Yeah, do you feel that? Let's get a temperature reading. The paranormal phenomena may be related to the hotel's rich and varied past. At different times, it was the home of St. Mary's Academy, St. John's Orphanage, and the famous Orleans Ballroom. Psychically, one of the team members actually saw residual images of dances and balls that had taken place there in the past. For over 2,000 years, people have reported ghosts and hauntings. Today, most paranormal research involves ESP and psychokinetic activities. There is very good evidence which suggests that most individuals do seem capable of picking up information without using their senses, what we call extrasensory perception. Now, that's rather different, however, than experiencing ghosts, although people who do have this sensitivity may in, in some way, you know, pick up on things in, in locations that other people do not. 
The Rhine Research Center in Durham, North Carolina, has been on the cutting edge of paranormal research thanks to J.B. and Louisa Rhine. They took paranormal research out of the seance room and brought it into the science laboratory. We still continue to look at those kind of extraordinary human abilities that we call extrasensory perception and also, to a lesser degree, psychokinesis. Now, the ESP, we're looking at through uh, one technique, it's called the Gansfeld, and it involves putting him or her into a rather mild state of sensory isolation, and we do that by putting ping pong balls over the eyes and putting headphones delivering white noise to the ears. The goal of this is to try to induce a sort of hypnotic or sleep-like state. And then they're asked to describe whatever thoughts and images are coming into uh, their mind. Now, in another room, isolated, somebody will be looking at a picture and trying to communicate it to their partner in the other room. Well, it's not a clear image. It's, uh... It seems foggy. While the Gonsfeld may be the tool to open the doors to the understanding of ESP, the detection of ghosts and hauntings is more complicated. There's no real evidence that any individual can dial up a ghost and uh, communicate with it. Despite Ghostbusters and X-Files, there are no simple gadgets that will detect ghosts. But ordinary cameras have picked up some rather unusual images. Are these photographic tricks, imperfections in the processing, or concrete evidence of the existence of visitors from the world beyond? Our nation's capital has experienced more than its share of hauntings and paranormal phenomena. One of the reasons Washington is so fascinating as a haunted city is not only because of all the power that's been involved, past and present, and the forces, if you will, but also the people who have verified these sightings. Presidents and first ladies have seen ghosts, congressmen and senators. The most uh, dramatic case was Her Imperial Majesty Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands. She was visiting the president, and she was put in the Lincoln bedroom. Very, very late at night, she heard a knocking at the door and there stood Abraham Lincoln. A few blocks from the White House is the Octagon House, a building dating back to the 1700s. Here, legends abound of unusual occurrences and visitors from the dead. The Octagon is a national historic landmark and one of the premier buildings in the history of Washington, D.C. It was built by Colonel John Taylor III who did so at the insistence of his friend George Washington, who wanted to see something developing here in this land that had nothing in it at that particular time. We had a ghost file, as we call it, and we keep all the documentation that we can find on any ghost stories that have been told. One of the, the most fascinating ones relates to a daughter of the Talos, supposedly, who, in a fit of melancholy that she would never be able to marry her lover, she threw herself over the stair. Well, there are a lot of stories about, uh, about the stairway. A very uh, well-known architectural photographer, he was on the upper landing in the octagon trying to get his camera set to do a shot, and he felt as though he was being pushed over the, the railing. The octagon served as a temporary White House during the War of 1812. Today, visitors report seeing the visage of First Lady Dolly Madison and smelling the scent of her lilac perfume. Even the U.S. Capitol is believed to be haunted. When President Garfield was assassinated, it was after a long and spectacular trial of the assassin Charles Guiteau. And a guard going through the rotunda suddenly thought he saw Guiteau walking through there, and he gave chase. And suddenly he stopped and realized, wait a minute, Guiteau was executed last week. And the ghost disappeared. The most haunted room in the Capitol is said to be Statuary Hall, once the chamber of the House of Representatives. Visitors report hearing the voice of John Quincy Adams passionately debating the issues of the day. And former guards claim that late one night, the statues came to life and danced a ghostly minuet. 
But the most alarming story is of a demonic cat who appears in the sub-basement of the Capitol near the tomb built for George Washington. The cat's appearance has foreshadowed national tragedies like the death of FDR in 1945 and the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963. America's fascination with ghosts and haunted houses is so great, we've started to create them for our own entertainment. There are approximately 7,000 commercial haunted houses in operation, all part of a trade called dark amusements. Today, at Halloween trade shows, you can find all you need to create your own house of horrors. I checked in the hotel the other day, and I asked him, I said, do you have the family rate? Because I have my, uh, my grandchild with me. After Christmas, Halloween is the largest retail holiday of the year a multi-million dollar business that is all about scaring. We're in the haunted house business. And the haunted house business has really grown in the last few years. Today, there are commercial haunted houses everywhere. Here at this trade show alone, I know that well over a thousand uh, operators of haunted houses were here, and they're trading their ideas back and forth. And the public's the one that's getting the benefit of all this. <laughs> Well, the unique thing about the commercial haunted house today is the material that's available to create and produce a haunted house. The deluxe mask, the movie quality props, they were just not available back a few years ago except if you spent thousands and thousands of dollars. Today we're in mass production for these items because there are literally hundreds and hundreds of haunted houses operating. Just off the board, in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Mayhem Manor offers a break from sea, sun, and sand. To begin your journey, please walk directly into the red vortex. Good luck, and welcome to Mayhem Manor. People pay just to go in and be scared to death. <laughs> Actually, Dr. Mayhem is my alter ego in that he studied fear. He studied people's reactions to fear. He built Mayhem Manor, disguised it as a tourist attraction, and began his experimentation on the locals going through the show. People go to haunted houses just like they ride roller coasters and bungee jump. People love the adrenaline rush. Mayhem Manor is a high startle live production. It is designed to be a one-man show. It's designed to startle a 21-year-old male because that's the hardest person to scare. We get a lot of wet pants. Uh, we've had two faintings. Don't step on the rats, it makes a man. We have had people crawl through the show on their hands and knees. Uh, we have people that refuse to move at all, and people that take off running and bounce off the walls all the way through the show. Watch out for rats. Don't step on the rats. It's an element of surprise is what is most effective. The action comes out of nowhere suddenly, and then it's gone again. We try to scare people from the side, the back, the top, the bottom. We literally chase the people through the show. Designing haunted houses is something that, if I wasn't getting paid to do it, I'd be doing it for free. For most, the spiritual is a matter of prayer and meditation, and ghosts and demons are imaginary. However, there are times when entities invade the body and haunt the human soul. Exorcism is 
of freeing from the power of the devil. The ritual is essentially prayer, invoking God and asking God to spare this person from the power of the evil one. History books describe John Bell's 19th century Tennessee farm as a battleground between good and evil, the place where a malevolent spirit began her centuries-old torment of the Bell family. Known as the Bell Witch, she was said to be Kate Batts, a spurned lover, jealous of John Bell's wife and family. The witch's reign of terror began with the appearance of a demon-like creature at the farm. Soon afterwards, a mysterious presence descended upon the Bell home. presence soon turned violent. Belle's daughter, Elizabeth, was a favorite target. Her hair was pulled and her face bruised by the evil presence. And the Lord spoke to the unclean spirits in the body of the woman and said, be thou gone. The family appealed to their minister, who attempted to exorcise the evil spirit. Let us pray. I can't. Oh. John Bell was mercilessly beaten and tormented by his unseen foe. Three years after Kate's first appearance, John Bell fell into a coma. It was said the Bell Witch had slipped poison into his medication. Oh, I walk in the valley of the shadow of death. He died on December 21st, 1820. Mourners heard the witch's laugh as he was lowered into his grave. Today, the Bell Farm is gone, but reports of a dark-haired apparition, mysterious lights, and ungodly sounds suggest that the Bell Witch may still haunt the site. Demonic forces are also blamed for the murders committed by Robert DeFeo, now serving a life term in prison for his crimes. DeFeo began his journey through the gates of hell in November of 1974, when he murdered his entire family as they slept. Today, the murders are all but forgotten, as novelists and scriptwriters have taken over, creating a series of books and films about a haunted house, the Amityville Horror. But is that where the story ends? Without question, the Amityville Horror House is one of the greatest hoax stories and one of the greatest haunted house stories this country has ever known, if not the greatest, absolutely. This was concocted by a novelist, Jay Anson, and the Lutz family, who bought the house, lived there for 31 days, ran out screaming some stormy night, they said and then w went on to write a best-selling book. DeFeo and his lawyers claimed he was driven by demonic voices to commit the murders. And while no one doubts that DeFeo was the murderer, what about the claims of demonic possession and the subsequent hauntings? Now, how do you still believe something happened after the principals tell you, no, we made it up? But still, People want to believe it because it does capture your imagination that in this beautiful house, some of the most bizarre things go on and that appeals to our darkest fears. Others demand more objective proof. The Center for Inquiry is home to the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of the Paranormal, PSYCOP, an organization dedicated to finding the truth behind paranormal activities. PSYCOP was founded in 1976. And the reason why it was founded was to bring together scientists, skeptics, academics, to look into the many, many paranormal claims. And they're across the board. Afterlife, poltergeist, ghostly hauntings, UFOs, 
and to try to find objective explanations. We founded the journal, The Skeptical Inquirer, and The Skeptical Inquirer is, is the leading journal reporting on our investigations. We try to look into whatever mysteries we can. Obviously, we can't uh, parachute into Peoria every time uh, Mrs. Smith thinks she has a ghost or every time someone sees a, a flying saucer somewhere. But we do uh, try to hit the bigger cases and we do investigate paranormal claims. During the uh, heyday of spiritualism, one of the attempts to communicate with spirits was done through the use of spirit slates. And of course this is a trick, but the slates would be shown both sides and they would be put together like this and along with a piece of chalk and they would wait and make suitable incantations for the spirits to come and uh, people would sit around a table with their hands held and so forth. And after some time, uh, Uncle Harry would come from the spirit world and and deliver a, a suitable message like this. Sheltered by towering redwoods, Brookdale Lodge lies just south of San Francisco. Once one of the West Coast premier resorts, the rustic setting and mountain air attracted Hollywood stars and other celebrities. To the sound of cascading water, guests dined and danced the night away in the Brook Room, a football field-sized room built over the waters of Clear Creek. Brookdale Lodge has had its share of trouble. A fire, flood, and the tragic drowning of the daughter of a former owner have left their indelible mark on the hotel. Perhaps they're why so many guests and employees are convinced it's haunted. Elon and I were, were cleaning up, getting ready to go, and um, I had heard some faint music, and I stopped and I said, Elon, do you hear that? And he said, yeah, I do. It was a mixture of people talking in the background and music, old-time music. And we thought someone had broken in and was just having an after-hours party, so we got the keys and we were going to go in there and kick everybody out, and we opened up the doors and everything just seized. Nothing. We didn't know what it was. Still don't know what it is. It was scary a little bit. And I was picking up tables, cocktail glasses off of tables, you know, cleaning the place up. And this ghost appeared and she just glided across the floor. And I just picked up those glasses as quick as I could and tried to get out of here. Guests and employees have reported another haunting that of a mother and her young daughter in the Brook Room. Are they ghostly specters reliving an earlier tragedy? It was about midnight and I was closing up, making everything was sure everything was secure, and I, I heard a little girl. I said, oh no, a little girl must be locked in here. So I went into the mermaid room and I opened up the doors and I saw an image of a little girl with braids. She had blonde hair, she looked about seven years old and um, the closer I got the image disappeared and so I was so certain that there was a little girl in there I searched the whole place I looked under tables everything and there was nobody in there to help explain the mysterious occurrences Joe Nichols from the Center for Inquiry was contacted to investigate the property I think the first thing that one tries to do with a haunted house is to gather data and see whether there is evidence, first of all, for some kind of hoax. Brookdale struck me uh, right away as not having the characteristics of overt hoaxing or prankery. This is where it all comes down to, the group room. Another type of case would be where something real is being misperceived. You've uh, seen something here or had some experience? Yes. And so I proceeded to, to see if I might find some plausible explanations for some of those phenomena. And I also gave them a questionnaire uh, that is used to measure their perceptive ability, their imagination, and so forth. Also investigating the haunting is Lloyd Auerbach, a San Francisco parapsychologist. His team will work with professional psychic Annette Martin 
in uncovering the ghostly secrets of the Brookdale Lodge. In the field of parapsychology, we look at interactions of the human mind, living or dead, if you want to look at it that way, with other minds, with the environment. The idea that the human mind can receive information from the environment or from other people, or the idea that the human consciousness or spirit survives the death of the body and somehow can cause some sort of impact on the environment. I work with things like using a magnetometer because geomagnetic fields, magnetic fields of the Earth, had in fact shown a correlation to people's ESP and psychokinetic experiences. I also tend to use people I trust who call themselves psychics or sensitives because they claim to have had similar experiences and can pick things up. Everyone has an electromagnetic field around their body and I have the capability of being able to read that. Immediately when I came in, I saw a young girl and I asked her her name and she was very shy and very demure and didn't want to give me her name, but she said that she liked to be called Katie. And she followed me around quite a bit while we were uh, looking to see all the different energies. I was quite surprised. Suddenly I felt this pull on my jacket. I just felt the presence of the little girl again. Behind me is like she's following and I turned around and there she was. I could see her. A pretty steady high. Yeah, yeah. I felt her kind of pulling on my coat a little bit. It's like they're moving. As we looked, all of Lloyd's um, meters were showing that the energy was quite high in this area. Where you pick up a high magnetic reading seems to correlate to a spot where people are having an experience. You got to look at this as a possible what we call haunting, in that it is a memory in the environment, so to speak. It's like the environment records something that happened there 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Occasionally, Polaroid film, for whatever reason, seems to get some very unusual patterns on it during real high spikes of the uh, magnetometer, and also sometimes when the psychics think, take a picture now, because they think they're picking up something. And I feel that Brookdale Lodge has a great many of the ghosts who come and go. In fact, I found a portal where they're coming in and out. So I felt that that was very exciting and very different. Doing any registration at all? Yeah, we're getting much higher. There's something out of the ordinary going on here in people's experience and in the environment based on our readings and based on what the people have picked up. And this is warranting a second visit for sure. I have not seen anything that seems to me evidence of haunting or supernatural activity here. But I have seen a correlation between the uh, people who don't believe in ghosts here, who therefore have never seen one, and those who do believe, uh, who do experience ghosts. I sometimes uh, make the conclusion that ghosts must be believed to be seen. I'm less skeptical now. I mean, I'm not a firm believer. Um, I wasn't drinking that night. I wasn't tired that night. I know that what I did see, I, I did see. You know, I like to think that there's an explanation. I was seeing things or whatever, but I wasn't looking for anything. And I don't know, I just think that there's, there's a lot of history here. And I think that there's a lot of good times we're here and there's some souls that don't want to leave. America's haunted houses occupy a deep place in our collective psyche. And even if ghosts don't exist, people want to believe in them. If we have a belief in life after death, then the experience of an apparition or you know, thinking one's seen an apparition can be interpreted as a, a, a departed soul. I have been in houses where the noises and the manifestations with witnesses are so profound that one has to believe there are things that do go bump in the night that we cannot explain. There really are no haunted houses or haunted restaurants or haunted inns, only haunted people. That's the great secret of hauntings, is it's, it's in the mind. I don't think we, any of us know really where we're gonna go when we die. And I think sometimes you run into a place where you can just get a glimpse of that.
the roadways to America's haunted houses wind through the worlds of myth, science, and religion. For skeptics, ghosts and hauntings are merely attempts by believers to explain the unknown. But for most, the truth is a genuine mystery, as elusive as the ghosts themselves. 